Hello guys and girls, today we will be talking about a topic I generally tend to avoid, and that is balance, and we're doing it in a serious manner. Loco recently published this little list that he has here on Twitter, and he called it the balance patch for 2022 StarCraft, aka Loco's dream journal. I figure we go over it, I talk about what I find good suggestions, what I think are poor suggestions, and maybe I'll add some suggestions of my own as well. We can talk a bit about balance, or I'll talk a bit about balance, and you guys can listen. So, starting with Loco's uh, changes here. <clears throat> for Zerk, he said, the lurker speed burrow is stupid, burrow slower. This is a, a pretty reasonable change. It feels weird that a unit that I think can be described as a siege unit with very large range is so quick at getting up from siege locations and then burrowing again. Feels a little bit too small and a small nerf there, I wouldn't mind. Second one is to reduce the ultra list size by 10 to 20% so they don't derp as much. I genuinely also believe this to be a good change. Most of the time, quality of life changes that make the game slightly easier, but it don't influence balance too much. I don't think it's much of an issue for me. I always found it very annoying that Archons never managed to get to the, the one hole in your gateway wall either. It always pissed me off. I wouldn't mind that changing, but the Ultralisk is even derpier than the Archon, and it's a melee unit, which makes it even more important. So yeah, I, I think just making a, a small size reduction would be kind of cool. Then the third change that local suggests is the Broodlord movement speed buff upgrade in the Greater Spire. I think this is a bad call. The Broodlord is a unit. Um, Balance-wise, I don't really have an opinion on this. Maybe they would be slightly too strong, but if we if we think about balance, then this might be a fine change. This is a change that you could suggest and we could test it. But if we think about game design, this is not something that we want because Broodlords generally don't really provide very fun gameplay. And if we want to actually have a balance patch at this point, I think it's important not only to slightly change the balance in some ways, but also to look at the areas where there is problematic gameplay. And I think in the PvZ late game, there just is problematic gameplay. And if we kind of take a look at the things that we could remove from both races to make that less problematic, I think the Broodlord would be a key unit that you would want to remove from the Zerg side, because free units tend to provide very poor gameplay. Whenever we have free units of some type in any type of matchup, um, it tends to slows down, slow down the game a lot, make it a lot more boring because one person most of the time is trading energy or a small amounts of cheap units against the free units or they need to poke from a distance, like in the case with Tempest. So I think, uh, yeah, I, I'm just not a huge fan of a, of a buff to the Broodlord speed. In general, I think we should scale back the late game capital ships, Carrier, uh, the Broodlord, you could even maybe make a case that the battle cruiser, ah, uh, battle cruiser is actually in a fine place. We'll leave it as it is for now. But the Broodlord and the carrier, I think we don't want any buffs to them. If anything, we want to scale them back and really have a late game that is focused around these these mid game compositions and then maybe supported with a couple of capital ships. Like a mothership can fulfill that role relatively well. Um, but I, yeah, the, the carrier and the Broodlord are just units that don't provide very interesting gameplay. And, and buffing these seems to be heading in the wrong direction. So that's where I first disagree with Loco. His fourth point is five, plus 5 slash 10 HP to Hydras. We've done this in the past. I have nothing against it. It, it makes them live a little bit longer in the mid game. And it might actually serve a purpose of making them more useful going into that later game phase. Um, so I, I think these are fair changes. I'll, I'll later on add a little bit of my own change. But first let's go over everything that Loco has has to do it somewhat, uh, you know, in a, in a systematic approach. Then for Terran, allow two Widow Mines in a medevac rather than four. I understand where this is coming from, as Widow Mine drops with the Drilling Claws are very frustrating to deal with. However, this also has implications against Protoss. This has implications against Protoss in the early game, against Protoss in the mid game, when Terrans often want to drop with like three, four mines in three to four medevacs. Um, if two entire medifacts would be filled up with four Widow Mines, that army all of a sudden is a lot weaker. And as that is one of the main threats that keeps Protoss honest, I don't think this is a good change. Against Zerg, I, I don't think it would matter. But, well, it would help against the Drilling Claws Mine Drops, but I don't think it would matter too, too much. So I think it's a change that does more harm than good and does some kind of opposed to it. I'm just, yeah, yeah, more harm than good, so no use. Next change, the battle cruiser minus one supply. Late game battle cruiser switches would be neat. 
I think the problem with the battle cruiser isn't necessarily the supply as it is the time it takes to get the battle cruisers out. There's just a very large part in the game if you're switching into battle cruisers in which the BC uh, in, in which a lot of supply is tied up and a lot of resources are tied up in a unit that isn't helping you yet. And with BCs, you kind of need to get the ball rolling. You need four or five in the late game maybe to make them useful. And I don't think the supply necessarily is the limiting factor, but the speed at which you can churn them out. So if our goal would be to get more battle cruiser late game switches, I think that would be better achieved by lowering the time that it takes to to get them. Because if we think about Protoss and Zerg late game units, the carrier with Corona Boost comes out honestly relatively fast the broodlord comes in stages so you start with the corruptor which is a useful unit by itself and then on top of that it, it goes into a broodlord but has a relatively quick morph time so there's always some use in the supply that you're already getting and the investment that you're making while with battle cruisers it's really all or nothing similar to the carrier except the carrier just builds a bit faster um, and i also feel like that Three carriers provide more value to a big ground army than three battle cruisers do because of the way that interceptors tend to um, interact with the opponent's army, forcing it to first attack the interceptors if an army is A moved. So carriers tend to have a larger impact faster and they're built quicker. So I think if you want to get PCs more in the late game, we should be working on the time. That being said, I'm not even sure if we want late game capital ships more than we currently have i actually kind of like the place that the battle cruiser is in where it serves some purpose with uh with mac in in tvz and everything else we don't really see too much so it really has a small niche in which this late game capital ship which is then being used in the early game kind of as a harassment unit i think it functions it functions nicely and it's in a in a, in a decent spot I, I think we should really go away from less capital ships rather than more all right ghost Minus 10 to minus 20 HP. You can definitely see that Loco is a Zerg here because I, if, if you see TVZ, the Ghost kind of feels like a catch-all type of unit against Zerg. It's okay-ish against Broodlords. It's good against Lurkers. does well against Hydras. Just against Link Bane at times is not great, but because of their tankiness, it still tends to be a little bit much. And once you get a very big Ghost count, and you get these nice siege lines, the game just slows down a little bit, and taking cost-efficient trades for Zerg becomes very difficult. However, if you remove the tanking power of the Ghost, then all of a sudden, maybe in the late game, it just would be close to impossible to actually take good fights as a Terran. Um, walking into Lurker lines with less HP, fighting Ling Bane. It's, it's really difficult to say how much really leans on the the health of the ghost and how much leans on, on other factors like mines getting their hits but it feels like yeah at, at maybe a 10 hp nor nerf would be good um but yeah it, it's hard to say we could also maybe try yeah try nerfing that in combination with some type of lurker uh, damage output nerf because without ghost fighting lurkers is impossible so if you nerf the ghost in strength the lurker will increase in strength which is in my mind not necessarily a major imbalance, but it's just the, the Lurker versus Ghost interaction or the Lurker versus the Terran army interactions. I don't think, especially by Terran players, are considered to be very fun. It is really difficult to fight against Lurkers for a large population of StarCraft 2 going up all the way to the very top. Um, there's a couple, like maybe three, four Terrans that feel comfortable against Lurkers, but there's a lot of Terrans that just don't feel comfortable. The moment that Lurkers come out, um, their Ghost control maybe isn't top notch but yeah there, there needs to be some alternative way ideally to deal with lurkers that isn't just pure ghost spam and maybe nerfing ghost is good but then at the same time you need to couple that i think with a bit of a lurker nerf and i'm not sure if a burrow nerf uh in that case a burrow speed nerf is going to be good enough we're gonna need to see some damage reduction in in any case i think or even a range reduction perhaps not possible but damage reduction i think so anyway i'm getting lost in my own thoughts continue with Loco's uh, essay. Somehow make landed Vikings a core part of Terran mech armies. Assault mode Vikings deal plus two damage to biological or something like that. I uh, I, I don't have enough experience with mech to, to understand if that would make a difference. I have a feeling it wouldn't. Um, so I think it's a rather... The, the goal here of the change... I don't think gets gets achieved with what he wants. If you want mech armies to to be better, I think we, we need to look at 
perhaps the role of the Cyclone a little bit in that matchup as a, as a mid-game control unit, but I don't think the Viking is where we want to be looking at changing mech in, in TVZ. Hyperflight rotors, Banshee speed upgrade, cost reduction to 125, 125. I still don't think we'd see it used too much, right? We'd still only see it with mech because it just takes up such a large part of your starport production in case you're playing bio. So maybe we'd see Banshees being used more as a starter for mech. But once again, because mech is so extremely unviable at the higher levels, I feel like that a buff to hyperflight rotors wouldn't really do very much. I think one of the problems that mech really has for Terran is, um, is that in the mid game, Zerg tends to be really free to kind of do whatever they want. And maybe we need to look a bit more at how, how Cyclones interact with certain units there and how, how good Ravager Link Bane tends to be against these Cyclone Hellion armies, especially when there's creep involved. But what exactly that would be, I haven't thought about enough and I'm not knowledgeable enough in that matchup and especially with the situation to really have any good solutions that would have to come from, from Terrans or Zergs that are more familiar with that interaction. Protoss. Remove the High Templar water balloons. And what he means with the water balloons is the auto attack of the High Templar. Now, usually I mentioned before that I think quality of life changes are always good. However, with the water balloons, it really feels like it just makes an army that already is very easy to control, which is an Ertos army with High Templars, even easier, where it just actually becomes a movable and afterwards you need to use the Templar. I think spellcasters should almost be forced to be in a separate control group. And this might sound a little bit elitist, where I'm saying if you can't control two control groups, that maybe you shouldn't be playing at the level that you're currently at then that's fine. I think something should just be difficult and I don't think all armies should just be a movable. So I like the suggestion of either making it even or removing it. But in this case, I am very big on just removing the High Templar auto attack as that honestly at the high level, it shouldn't matter that much. And it makes the late game interactions between uh, mainly Zerk and Protoss, but also maybe in some cases between Terran and Protoss armies a little bit, uh, a little bit more fair. Because Terran do need a separate hotkey for Ghost. I know not every Terran does it. Looking at some of you guys at home. Uh, but ideally you do have a separate hotkey for Ghost. Because otherwise stimming becomes difficult. You need to tap first. Uh, revert the Void Ray build time to from to 37.43. I think this is a, 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 a very good suggestion. I think the Void Ray isn't necessarily too powerful at the higher level. But I think there's a couple of issues with that. And in order to show that, I actually want to show you guys some stuff in-game. Okay, so when we use Void Rays against Zerg, especially in larger numbers, a big issue, especially at the lower levels, is bases that have some type of cliff next to them and then have another base close by. Because this forces the Zerg player to split queens. First of all, they need to perfectly split, split queens. They need to have a correct amount of queens in position and they need to know that the void rays are coming from that direction as well. So imagine these void rays are flying here and they start by attacking this base. You need to have half of your queens over here and half of your queens in the main base. However, the Protoss player only really needs a single group of void rays to fly through. The movement is extremely easy um, and it makes the attack A potentially very very dangerous because if the queens are out of position the void rays can just fly in so this is something that often happens is where queens will chase the void rays void rays just use their prismatic alignment to take out this base and then the queens need to walk around to get to the base by the time they arrive there the void rays are already done and they can continue harassing other bases a very small amount of void rays can force a very uh, big reaction out of the Zerg. And also it's a very difficult reaction out of the Zerg. The defensive measure here is, is way harder to do than the aggressive part, which makes the Void Ray, in my opinion, currently not a very fun unit to play against in ZVP from the Zerg side, and also feels unfair in terms of what you need to do in order to execute it. At the highest level, this is less important because Zerg have very good map awareness. They have good que queen spreads and queen splits already, and they tend to have Zerg circling spread around the map so they know where the Void Ray army comes from. But if you move anything below High Grand Master, this task of just knowing where the Void Rays are coming from is extremely difficult. And if you fail, even for just five seconds, you immediately lose a base 
or you lose five, six overlords, straight up losing the game. While for the protos flying across the map, just controlling these units and doing that costs very little effort and there's almost no downside. So there is very little risk, a potentially very high reward. And for the Zerg, there is no reward to defending well. It's not like you can catch the Void Rays, you just deflect them. And this makes the Void Ray, in my opinion, just not a very good uh, unit currently in, in the meta game. It doesn't promote fun gameplay very much. Add on to that, by the way, that often with Void Rays, um, there is a sure way to go into the late game by building Disruptors, because the Disruptor beats everything on the ground. The Void Ray beats basically everything else as well. And the only way you can beat this type of play is by doing a very dedicated Queen Walk. You've kind of come into this, this stage in ZVP where the Zerg needs to decide to either early on Queen Walk the Protoss player, or they're forced into a late game. But mid-game timings are practically impossible. And with the Void Ray Disruptor combination, on top of that, to end this all off with, it just becomes really easy for Toss to survive without having any good scouting knowledge. So usually what happens in a matchup is that there's a bunch of timings and all-ins that if you play well, you can defend against. But if you scout incorrectly or you're too greedy, it becomes difficult to defend against. With the Void Ray Disruptor, that's just not really true because naturally you're investing so much into static because you only need very little production structures in like two, three stargates, a robotics facility, and then the rest you can just build bases and cannons with, and you're just blindly producing units. Like you can basically have a plan for the first 10 minutes in PVZ and 99% of the time survive. I think that is an issue. There needs to be some type of responding in the game. And that's currently not quite the case with these void ray openers. And that is why I generally think that um, the suggestion that Loco makes here is that reverting the Void Ray build time is a good change, but I'm not even sure if it's enough. We could start looking at things like Flux Veins, um, making the higher numbers of Void Rays just a, a little less good because they don't have the speed upgrade, or just generally removing the speed of the Void Ray a little bit. There is one thing that I'm worried about is that I didn't used to really like playing against a lot of the 16 pool Rocha Lins, and having a very quick Void Ray against that does feel pretty nice. So in one way, I guess against 16 pool, it's a very niche scenario and I probably shouldn't whine too much, but um, yeah, I, I, I feel like it should be fine to just just put a lot of nerfs on the void rate, two, three different nerfs. Uh, ideally keep the cost the same, but you know, make it slightly slower in general, consider removing flux veins and increasing the void rate build time, I think would be a very good start to make the PVZ game more reactive from the proto side, make it easier for the Zerg as well to defend these multiple bases with Queens, especially at the lower level, and to make sure that the PVZ matchup isn't just a Queen walk or late game type of scenario. There needs to be different shades of, 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 of gray, basically, than just white and black in, in, in this case. I, I think that's really, really important. If there's one thing that I'd wish um, that Blizzard changed, it, it would be it would be that just having a look at that that CVP uh, that CVP situation. But we'll continue with the local list as I kind of went off on a tangent. All right, increase the cooldown on battery overcharge a little. I think that's also a good thing. Having being capable of using the battery overcharge multiple times in the same defense seems like a bit much. And also forcing out a battery overcharge doesn't feel like a very big thing anymore. So I I do believe that increasing the cooldown on battery overcharge a little here is a good suggestion. I like that. The Colossus damage from 10 plus 5 versus light to 11 plus 4 versus light. So a slight buff to the Colossi to the general damage output. I don't mind it, honestly. Um, might make it a bit harder for Terrence to defend certain mid-game pushes. I'm, I'm seeing some potential issues with Phoenix Colossi 8k type of stuff to be harder, which is already a relatively low skill all-in that requires a lot to defend. Whenever I think about balance or about how I'd want to change the game, I would want to make um, I, I, I'd want to make things a little bit harder where they're currently too easy to either just survive into a late game situation or when there's an all-in that can just be really easily executed without much thought. Perhaps you also want to think about not buffing that too much. So I'm not sure exactly what the goal here is because he didn't state it. I guess they would be better against Roaches and Marauders. Um, they still wouldn't be used in, in PvP. So I 
yeah, I, I'm not entirely sure about this. I'm, I'm not naturally opposed, but I'm also not naturally for it. I just kind of neutral, I guess, in a way. We can try it, see what happens. Next, the observers can be built from the Nexus once a robo facility is built. Um, this is a this is a cool suggestion, which I'm really surprised that 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 locals suggest this because this is a, a proto specific issue. This is something that a protos would say, and then the other two races say, "Oh, that sounds stupid." But this is a really cool change because often in in any matchup, honestly, the observer feels like a waste of your robotics facility time um, to build because you want to be getting immortals, prisms, and you're often giving something up in terms of vision in order to get other things. Now, I think this is not necessarily that bad as a trade-off. I actually think that is not 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 that bad of an idea, uh, that there is a trade-off for getting more vision. Now, of course, there's still a trade-off if you have Nexi because then you're cutting probes, but because, yeah, I don't know. It feels like you have more options to get a lot of vision, and especially against Terran, I think this could be slightly problematic. If you want to increase um, the amount of observer, observers that are being built, there needs to be more of a downside of observers. Um, make them more clear for people to see, even when they're invisible. Make there be a little bit of like buzzing audio when you're centered on an observer. Like things like this could be done, like an audio warning that an observer is nearby. This way, you still uh, force your opponent to have some type of detection there but it also alerts them that there is an observer because it's very frustrating for the other two races when they're not aware that there's an observer near. So whenever they're in observer mode, you could just constantly have them play like a buzzing noise or something like that. And when they're just regularly flying around, not have that be. But I think this is a cool suggestion that I never would have thought of that I think with one or two tweaks, um, like I mentioned, definitely could be, could be workable. The Phoenix from damage five, to plus five to light to six plus four light. So I guess this is also a buff just in general to the Phoenix. I don't think the Phoenix needs a buff. So I maybe I'm just misunderstanding these things. I never, look guys, I barely finished high school. So once the language get a little bit difficult, I, I tend to tap out. So if this doesn't mean that he wants to buff the Phoenix, then I don't know what it means. But if he wants to buff the Phoenix, then I, I I don't see any any point to that. I think the Phoenix is in a in a in a fine spot. Some final notes here from Loco. I'm not sure how to change these. Queens are too well rounded. This is true. The queen is is too well rounded. However, the queen needs to be well rounded right now in the current state, especially to deal with Protoss threats and especially with the Void Ray. However, if we take some some nerves on the Void Ray and we'd say we increase the building time, we remove a bit of the speed. I wouldn't be necessarily opposed to removing one of the range from the queen against air. I mean, why not? That makes Oracle harass a little bit better, more incentive for Oracle harass. I think people like seeing Oracle harass. It's like, it's fun to defend or well fun. It's fun to do, it's, uh, it's fun to defend. Like both players need to be very active with the unit. The Oracle is a unit that requires a lot of micro to control well. And the defense requires a lot of good positioning and vision on the map as well. So you have two, two people working very hard at either doing damage or stopping damage. And based on who is better at that interaction, you get damage. Well, in the case of Void Ray versus Queen, you have one guy that's sitting with his fist up his bum and the other guy that is uh, microing with five hands to get his queens in the correct positions. And then there's no reward for the Zerg player if it goes well. Well, with the Oracle, they need to get close. So they either take whole damage or they don't. There's a, there's a cool little interaction there, I think, that you don't really have with Void Ray against Queen. And perhaps one range less on the Queen would be a good thing. Could also make Hellbat all ins a bit stronger. Would make all the Terran harass a bit stronger. Liberators. Um, any type of medevac attack, obviously. So th there might be issues there. Uh, we could also consider lowering the queen HP, but that might make disruptors too strong against queen if they can one-shot queens. So there's yeah, there, there there's a lot of things there. I, it's it's hard to say. I'm here with low code. I think queens are too well rounded and they require some type of nerf. But what that is is really difficult to say without breaking any other parts in the game. Mm, Ghost. Ghosts have too much power overall. I agree with Loco. I'm not sure if an HP nerf is the correct call. 
I do think that ghosts have too much power. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they're imbalanced or overpowered, but that too much of the Terran power in the late game is really around this one unit in the ghost. And you'd rather have that spread among different units. And you'd have these different units kind of have their own niches in which uh, in certain situations, the Liberator is better. In other situations, the Ghost is better. In other cases, again, the Tank or the Widowmine or the Thor is best. Um, but the Ghost is kind of the catch-all response to everything late game that Zerg can throw at you. And even in um, even against Toss, there's really no downside to having a couple of Ghosts. But I, I kind of like how they function against Toss. I'm not going to complain about that. Um, swarm hosts are a bit weak in standard games. Yeah. And I like that. I really dislike Swarm Host. I hate free units. I wish that unit didn't exist. The Swarm Host era is the worst era of the entire life. It's extremely frustrating to play against free units. I I don't want that again. So I'd like to keep that a bit weak. No change suggested by Loco and no change necessary. Maybe nerf it even more Loco. Make them 12 supply. I hate Swarm Host. Cloaked Widow Mines are kind of dumb. Hmm... This is one of the things where I'm not entirely sure. I, If Widow Mines weren't cloaked, they'd lose so much of their value uh, after the armory finishes. And then you'd need to buff Terran in the mid game in some other way. And it, it, it just so many interactions depend on this that I can't oversee what would happen if you'd, you'd go for a change there. It's, uh, yeah, I, I just don't know. I just don't know. I don't think you can change this. And I, I think it it also is fine at the higher levels in a way where the Widow Mine is just beatable. And even at lower levels, the Widow Mine is, is kind of beatable as well. So it is annoying, but I don't personally see it as a big issue right now. No. Okay. I think that's Loco's list. Now, I have a couple of things that I'm passionate about personally as well. So... Let's get into these. Now, one thing I want to talk about is the carrier and how it makes the micro very difficult. And in general, the power of the A-move Ertos army. Okay. So if we have these two armies, which um, is like a, a Zerg and a, a Protoss army, right? For the Protoss army, with this army, you can get very far. I've seen high level pro games in which Protoss players don't even use High Templar. They literally use a single control group and all the micro that goes on in the entire Protoss army is this, okay? They A move. Meanwhile, the Zerg needs to use a couple of different spells. They need to ideally target fire as well on as many units as they can. This Protoss even forgot to use the, the prismatic alignment for a little bit. And all Toss really does here is A move. It's all they do. And the Zerg needs to use three, four different control groups. And at the end of the day, the difference in outcome isn't even this big. It looks like the Zerg here is still going to be winning because we have... Well, a bunch of units remaining. But also because they had 30 more supply. And the Toss literally did nothing. I think this is a real issue. In um, Once again, if one player needs to do everything correct in order to have about an even fight, even when they're up in supply or to have a better fight, that is not a good thing. If both players have a, a similar type of late game army and both of them just A move, I understand that there's always going to be differences in outcome. Like one race is always going to have a slightly better non micro army. But I think the difference in the Protoss army and the Zerg army is slightly too big. And that definitely shows in the lower levels. And this is two issues. One, it gives the issue that it becomes really difficult for lower level players to play late game, while it's really easy for Toss to get there in the first place, like I mentioned earlier. And second of all, it is difficult for Protoss to differentiate between the, the the lower Grandmaster Tosses and the higher Grandmaster Tosses, as the, the control is very similar. There just isn't too much to do in the fights. And that is an issue. Um, one of the ways, I think, that we could fix this is nerfing the carrier. I think the carrier makes fights 
for Zerg really difficult because of the way that interceptors interact with any army is that the interceptors become the main target for whatever army is fighting against it that can attack air. So you saw the corruptors just kind of bugging around, trying to look for more interceptors to kill. You always need to shift click things. Now, this army didn't have an, even have any Archons or Storm, but if you're shift clicking and the Toss has one or two Archons or they have like three, four Storms, your entire corruptor army is just going to straight up fall. Very frustrating, of course. Um, but there's very little, very little effort for the toss, and I think I think that's an issue. So I think what should be done is I think the carrier should be nerfed into oblivion. And when I say oblivion, I truly just mean it should be nerfed out of the game, basically. Like I, I never really have in any game where I look at a, a game and think, "Wow, this carrier made this game better." I thought this game was a seven out of ten entertainment value. But after these 12 carriers came out, this became a 10 out of 10 or an 8 out of 10. It almost always the excitement level goes down. I think that is just a bad unit. I think we're right now in StarCraft at a point where if we have a unit where the entertainment value goes down when that dude comes out, we should maybe just say, maybe we can find a niche for it, like the Battle Cruiser, where it comes out in the early game and it can harass it a little bit, like make it come out quick, but make, make the units be kind of crap. And just have it be like some type of weird all-in or as a transition into an into an other build. But this shouldn't be the, the focus of our late games, the, the carrier. It makes the game worse. I, I truly do believe that. Um, and um, now I hear all of you Protoss players out there go, well, if they're touching the carrier, how am I ever going to win a late game? Because Broodlords and Investors together are unbeatable. The second point of the plan. We also nerfed the Broodlord into Oblivion. We... Just destroy the stats of it, however way you want. Make it even slower. Make it more supply. Like I don't really care. Like maybe, may, maybe make it more supply. Maybe that actually is the answer. That it's so supply uh, inefficient that you don't really want a lot of them. It's nice to have a couple, but not too many. It's not good to just defend spots with. Like you, you need to use it as some type of weird all-in into the mid game. That's the only way that you can use it, or you're just gonna lose late game fights. I think that would be a good way. And I really think it is important that people start to realize that although the capital ships are probably designed to be late game units in a way, the more capital ships we tend to see in a late game or the more like capital units we tend to see in a late game, the worse the late game tends to be. Uh, this is the case for carriers. This is the case for Tempest to, in, a, in a large way. Uh, brute Lords, I mean, they're almost naturally very campy units until you get there. So there's a long time in which you're getting this army where both guys are camping or one guy's trying to break it. And then once you have it, the game tends to move really slow because these armies are really slow and they tend to rely on a single battle. And I think, um, yeah, I think that is quite bad. I, I, I really don't don't like that. So that is my that is my that's my main point here. Actually, we went over, over all of locals changes, and I think I had some good input there as well. But if there's one thing that I think needs fixing, it's the PVZ late game. And these would be my suggestions. It's by, uh, first of all, making it more difficult for Protoss to get into the late game, making the early and mid game defense for Zerg weaker by slightly nerfing the queen. Um, so there's multiple options as well for Protoss. I don't think anyone would be happy with just having Oracle uh, options open as Protoss. There needs to be something done that... Um, Twilight openers, the T drops are slightly better. And a queen nerf, as they really do give a large part of that defense, would be a good start there as well. Um, and then from there on out, I think you, you can just throw one big patch at it, but maybe multiple small patches or one bigger patch and then kind of tweak it. But this requires an active Blizzard Activision, and that might be difficult to achieve. All right. Um, it kind of became a bit ranty at the end. I'm sorry for that. I'm also sorry if I forgot anything. Um, I know some of you probably want to hear about Disruptors against Terran or Dark Templars, but I think these are rather minor issues. And uh, yeah, I, I don't really see too much. Well, there's something wrong with it, but we can get into it maybe another time if I feel like making another video. That's going to be it for, for me today, actually. Thanks to Loco for having this beautiful little document that inspired me to make this video. For the people that expected a StarCraft today, I'm sorry for that as well, but uh, it's not happening because just not a lot happened in the past week, only an EPT Cup. Uh, I think Zest won two of them. I could be wrong. Well, I'll have to look. I'll do it next week, next week, Zesty today. <laughs>
All right, it's going to be it for me today. Thanks all so much for watching. If you have any thoughts yourself on balance, be sure to leave them down below in the comments. Um, if you don't have any thoughts on balance, then just actually give me your favorite pasta recipe in the comments in that case. And if you do have thoughts on balance, but they're kind of disjointed, just press the like button, okay? We don't want to hear from you. That's going to be it for me today. Thanks all so much for watching. I hope you did enjoy it. If you did, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you all next time for a new video. Thank you, and bye-bye.